this is for it. Yeah. Uh, and he's developing this sort of unresolved stance towards ontology. He'll move away from it later on, and he'll sort of have his big uh, contestation of ontology and the Heideggerian uh, different meaning of ontology. So here in the early phases, he's still he's still uncertain. I think he's still unresolved, very much influenced by Heidegger, and he also uses Heideggerian terms of being and becoming in this work. And later he will use more different terminology and see ontology as a form of brutality and tyranny uh, in ontological imperialism, as he calls it. And he views a term metaphysics instead. And this phrasing otherwise than being. So maybe he's developing a non-ontology in this phase in his work. Maybe that's a term that's been used before. So it is an ontology and it's also a contestation of ontology at the same time. And I think that's, that uh, amb ambivalence and ambiguity is interesting. And I think that's, uh, that ambiguity can also be transferred to how we understand universities as institutions. So that's sort of why I, I chose um, to stand there um, in that part of Levinas's work. Um, yeah, let me just be here. So uh, first I'll say something about the departure, point of departure from Levinas's work, and then say something about the implications for university science education. And then I'll try to discuss this. Maybe I don't know if it's new, this form of theorization of the university as rift. Uh, that's that's a plan. And I'll try to keep to time and so on. Otherwise, yeah, but you can stop. Um, let's see. You can see that I'm changing my slides right now and going to live in us. Okay, cool. So yes, live in us early work, um, written a series of notes in a German prisoner camp. During the war, live in us was a prisoner of war from 1940 to 45. And he wrote most of what, of what became this book in note form uh, during his uh, imprisonment. So some of that, not to go into the bi biographical details, but some of the gloom is definitely in in the work uh, there, uh, I think. Um, and I'll use Levinas to discuss the university as an in-between state, uh, as a state of liminality, uh, as a state of suspension, as a pause or a lack, an interruption, a hesitation in both epistemically, also societally, po politically, and culturally. So that notion of in-betweenness and liminality in Levinas's work, I want to use that to, um, to sort of theorize universities with. And in the book, Levinas is circling this uh, term, he calls it Ilya, which sort of is translated to, there is not that there is anything in particular, but just the state of there is an anonymous sort of form of existence without any identity taking, without any form of subjectification or objectification, but stripped from any form of naming an identity, any stripped of any form of proper uh, philosophical conceptualization. So it's also perhaps a form of uh, anti-philosophy here that he's uh, embarking on. <clears throat> And Levinas is writing that, so this state of Ilya, it's uh, interrupting our relations with the world. It uh, sort of yeah, strips us away from our identity, who we are also as academics, what the goals of uh, learning and teaching is perhaps, he's not talking about education here, uh, but, uh, but more the existence more generally. So the, the existence as something undecided, as something unresolved and something uh, unfixed, um, we also use this term on the unfixing, um, or I do that together with Ryan Gildersleeve in a, in a book chapter. So the unfixing of the university is sort of also what, what could be derived from, from this, I think. So this uh, phenomenological uh, exploration Levinas is carrying out uh, in this book, he tries to describe uh, almost phenomenologically different states of this um, Ilya. And the first state, uh, Cause indolence. And indolence is a form of weariness. When you're weary of yourself, of the maybe the dull machinery, mechanics, things, 
um, when you want to escape existence, but not entirely sort of dissolve it. So it's not, as he says in, in a later quote, it's, uh, he says here that it's an evasion without an itinerary, without a travel plan. Uh, it's a parting for the sake of parting. And here he says it's not, it's not idleness, it's not rest. Um, and it's sort of, uh, oh, it's, it's later on. It's not, really, it's not really death, but it's not the pure ego either. It's something between identity and the dissolvement uh, of, of existence. And in indolence, sometimes we are overwhelmed by duties, what we should do, but we just don't do it. We don't want to. We don't have uh, the energy. We can't see the purpose of it. We don't do it. We, we know that we should do something, but we don't do it. We just don't. Maybe there's no reason. We just don't do it. And in this quote here, which is also maybe bringing the thought back to the context of the writing, lying in the bed in the morning, and you know you should get on with the day, but you can't. You don't. You just don't put the foot, the feet down from the bed and get on with the day. You lay, you're, you're still in this state of just lying there or indolence. Um, and of course, in a prisoner camp, one can certainly understand that, but also transferring it uh, to, and Levinas don't want to psychologicalize this. This is an ontological exploration. It's not about psychology. It's not about sociology. It's not about analyzing organizations. This state of indolence, not laziness, but yeah, not idleness, but sort of just, you can't really muster the energy. He says that's an ontological, that's an ontological dimension, not something we should try to describe as inauthentic. An illusion should be overcome. No, it's, it's real. It's equally real in its unrealness. The next, uh, the next uh, aspect he brings forward, he calls uh, fatigue, which is, you can see with the, the terminology, it's quite related form of numbness. And very interestingly, he describes this, I think, lack, this of hesitation within existence. So existence is sort of lacking behind itself. It's being delayed. It hasn't caught up with itself. So within existence itself, not beyond, not underneath, forward, but within existence, there is a, a lack, a delay or, or hesitation. And also a slackening, a letting go of the world or letting go of who we are, what we should do, what duties we should fulfill, what roles we should play, what responsibilities we should assume and so on and so forth. This is sort of, it's not happening. Um, which Levinas tries to sort of focus in on uh, and tries to explore. He also calls it, I just want to dwell with some of the phrasing here, it's beautiful, I think his language, there's a lot of poetry in, in Levinas, it's a time lag, sort of, uh, also an, this time lag is inscribed within existence itself, and it sort of challenges this contract with being that he talks about, that we have a contract with being to become someone, to do something, to realize potential in our existence or in university, for example. But uh, this lag is overwhelming that contract and perhaps uh, challenges us to rethink that contract uh, with being a new, there's a hesitation, a way of surprising existence. It's all very uh, quite abstract. I'll try to, to also, uh, connect it uh, with the context later. But I think this exploration of Levinas's uh, uh, vocabulary is, is important. At least it has been uh, important uh, for me. Next aspect, darkness or obscurité. Obscurity, maybe it should be translated into it. It's Alfonso Linkis who's translating and using the term darkness. Uh, I'm not sure, if, I don't know, English speakers or pe people who speak French can decide. I'm not very proficient in, in either language, so I'm not sure, but here it's translated into darkness, uh, at least. And darkness is, as he writes, a nocturnal space, but it's not empty. It's full of the nothingness of everything, and it's sort of circulating or penduling uh, between being and nothingness. It is in this in-between space. Heidegger also uses 
the term of the threshold to try to uh, to talk about uh, similar issues. And this uh, Levinas moves the language also to a Shakespearean universe. Maybe you can recognize some of this from uh, Macbeth, for example. And um, in a later quote, he talks about this oxymorons, which are phrasings that are actually contradictory, but he tries to he really pushes uh, the limits of, of the language here and also avoiding the, the sort of the conceptualization. It's a conceptualization that's not really a conceptualization. He says the notion of darkness or the state of darkness is presence of absence. How does that make sense? It doesn't make sense, does it? It's like the density of the void. It's like the murmur of silence. So it's an active form of negativity. It's an active form of presence. Something is there, but it's not really present in the same way that we usually would describe things that are present. We try to resist the capture with language or concepts of these forms of, uh, of existence. And just the, the last one here, and then I'll... Then I'll... Uh, he calls that uh, insomnia. So when we actually become uh, caught up in the state of we're not really there, but we are not there either. We are sort of existing, but we are not really existing in the sense of, you know, knowing what to do with an intentionality. It's a form of suspension or uh, maybe dismantling of, of intentionality. And uh, insomnia, he writes that it's uh, when one watches, when there's nothing to watch really, but we are still, we are still watching, but not for something in particular. There's no intentionality in the watching. It's a form of seeing or listening without the uh, maybe assimilative gaze of the conceptualization. It's, uh, uh, he also describes it as a form of vigilance. So we are attentive, it's a form of awareness and attention, but without knowing about what yet. We don't know what will come out of the forest when we are sitting on a night watch or what will happen, but we are, we're still there and we cannot really go to sleep, but we cannot wake up either. So we're in a state of caught up in this uh, state of uh, of insomnia. It's as if the insomnia is uh, objectifying us, he writes in a, in a different passage. So we become caught up in this state of, of non-being, but we are still, we're still there. Um, okay, so that was a little bit of, of, of Levinas. And uh, so where, where to go with this? Um, well, just to mention, to start with a few uh, examples of um, how I try to work with this, both with with Ron Barnett and, and Gloria Del Elga. And with Ron, it has been uh, implications for how to understand the university and its stance as an institution that I'll say a little bit about. And also with Gloria, it has been about implications for how to understand learning, but from this uh, Levinasian uh, point of view, this point of view of, of darkness. I'll just mention that. And if you want to know more, you can also uh, read more in the papers. This one was uh, one of the first papers we published, Confronting the Dark Side of Higher Education. And in this paper, we go through four different forms of darkness. Darkness of learning, darkness of teaching, institutional darkness, and imaginative darkness. And I remember discussing, I think, an early version of this with Christian in, in, in London at the IOE when Christian was a visiting uh, researcher there. And I was also visiting and, and Christian provided very helpful uh, uh, critical feedback uh, to me about. But that was this paper that we were developing uh, at the time. Um, and the point in the paper is to try to find new language to talk about the being and becoming uh, of universities without uh, defaulting or using language that are already capturing uh, uh, processes of being and becoming, without talking about becoming, but without calling it well-being, for example, or talking about uh, formation or building without using the language of taxonomy, uh, or talking about the, the passion and enjoyment of uh, academic uh, community building, academic work, without talking through the language of staff satisfaction service, for example. So trying to resist the uh, organizational forms of, of, of language and arguing also that uh, th there's a lot of there's a lot of, um, of activities that may be dark to those discourses, but it's very real, but it's, it often doesn't 
it often doesn't have a language of its own. So this was maybe trying to find the, the ground level or to provide a theoretical argument, allowing for that also ontologically. Um, maybe not really helpful to anyone. It was helpful to us anyway uh, at this time. And in one of the examples about imaginative uh, darkness, uh, trying to, to also find an ontological space where there's no easy answers uh, to reply to the university societal stance and the elements of entanglement and super complexity that universities are also brought up in culturally, politically and societally. So it's uh, resisting, strategizing and policy language, but staying in the complexities maybe of universities, um, not falling into the trap on the one hand, of being dystopian and talking about uh, a golden age that's always some seems to be sort of in the immediate past, but also not being naive and uh, uh, and not realizing the uh, the deep uh, the deep cuts or the challenges that universities face uh, politically and, and societally. So finding that sort of also with the late David Watson trying to find that sort of mi middle ground or middle place. I think Ron has also used a term which could be similar here to Watson's remark of the feasible utopia. It's sort of a, again, as Andrew was talking about, speaking from the middle where there's no clear, where the discourse is not really, it's not a discourse yet. So nothing can be or should be discursively captured. It's a tentative space. It's a vocabulary that doesn't really have its grammar yet doesn't have the syntax that would harden the language and and maybe uh, resulting in a form of of semantic or discursive uh, discursive capture so finding that uh, that that in between space a state of liminality to uh, to discuss um, uh, academic activities if we call it that academic work university practices uh, through other languages so we try to find an ontological route for that uh, in that in this space. Uh, in the paper with uh, with Gloria, we explored the meaning of learning and contested this uh, uh, obsession with with active learning, with learning being active and visible, performative, identifiable, um, uh, that it should be demonstrated and, and so on and so forth. So we discussed, so how can, what is learning when we start to not know, for example, what do we learn by not knowing? instead of knowing. So it is a form of reversed uh, understanding or theorization of, of learning. So instead of understanding learning as moving towards certainty and a certain privilege of knowing, uh, a, a certain power, which is an epistemic power, so relinqu relinquishing that power and moving to a much more uncertain and also vulnerable place, is what form of learning is that? It's not something that should be countered and is a fault in learning and should be remedied. It's actually a, a very important form of learning. So what does it mean, for example, to read this, we call it point zero, for learning when you don't know anything you're not competent you you have no skill you realize you're you you have you have nothing you have no power really epistemically or academically um but try to conceptualize that as a very important form of uh, of learning and another argument uh, and another point in the, in the paper i'll also just mention here is um also um relating to the we use the term horror from from Sartre, when you re realize that you are free, there's sometimes a sense of horror connected to it. It reminds a little bit of Kierkegaard's differentiation between anxiety and freedom. Anxiety is also horrific, or it's uh, filled with the realization of freedom. That's why it's anxiety and not just fear. So when students realize that teachers don't know, that they don't know, no one knows, you know, you go to the university and at least you would expect that your teachers would know the truth or be experts or have a certain uh, proficiency and of course they do in a certain way but uh, teachers in universities also seem to be very fond of of relinquishing that certainty of knowing and moving into a state of unknowing so sometimes students re uh, experience that teachers move away from the certainty that the students were expecting they would move towards and now their teachers are relinquishing or giving away that certainty so what what is going on which is also a form of uh, of uh, of surprise 
it can be very overwhelming, which is also, uh, we try to argue, a form of, of learning. And all of this relates to a form of, we use it, we use the term darkness to try to uh, to conceptualize that in, in different ways. Also, yeah. the, the last example, then I'll try to move uh, towards some form of, uh, of, of conclusion. Uh, in this paper, it was uh, in the first specialist view in the uh, in the society uh, associated journal philosophy and theory in high education that Ryan Gillesley co-edited with one of his colleagues when he was um, at Denver. And in in this paper, we try to argue that there's actually a a deeper that deeper forces under the university it has a we, we, i don't know if we coined the phrase maybe it doesn't matter maybe someone else has done that but there is a dark ontology there's an ontology underneath the university there are forces underneath the university is just a form like heidegger has this uh, brilliant example i think in his essay das Ding, or the thing where he writes that the if you look at a cup this is typically heideggerian uh, examples you have the mark but it's it's what the it's what the is being it's not the form, but what the form is forming around that really, uh, really signals the essence of, of the cup. So the teaching practices and the, uh, the campus, the tables, the lamps and the computers and what we have, they're just form taking around the university. So the, the being and becoming of the university is what gives um, if what is what initiates the opportunity of the form taking, but if we usually confuse the form taking with the university itself, or with the being and becoming of the university. The being and becoming of the university is much deeper than that, and it's very difficult to uh, uh, to uh, to make visible or create a vocabulary around directly. But what we can see, maybe living as would say, the trace, what we experience now, what this seminar, it's a trace of the university, what the university is withdrawing or the university is sort of underneath. There's a dark ontology, and this is a trace or a respond. Uh, Heidegger would maybe also say, this is a respond to that. It's a form of reaction uh, to the to the being. This is only ontically. It's also a form of, of uh, is, uh, 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 ontically it's taking place, but the ontology is different. So there's something, there's a dark ontology. Uh, and the last example from that paper, we also drew a little from Sartre. Sartre has this, I think, interesting uh, ontological understanding of the question. The question has is a form of has a form of being. It's a negative element, but that negative element of the question is what cast, as he says, makes the world iridescent. It's really casting a shimmer over things and make things become uh, alive. It's not the replies. It's not the answers. Uh, it's not the conclusions. It's not the evaluations. It's not the strategies or the policies or the cheating schemas and so on and so forth. It, the question uh, is is uh, Sartre is trying to analyze the question ontologically, and the question is is uh, part of that maybe dark ontology maybe the universities is the question or this the university is maybe the form giving around a question or i don't know how to how to to say that um and maybe it's, it's i think it's more radical than just wonder you know the aristotelian of course this notion of the question is is uh, as old as, as philosophy as philosophy itself is certainly much older than university but i don't know if the the term of wonder is just radical or strong enough the notion of the question in the satrian sense is it's, it's much stronger it's much more uh, unsettling it's much more worrying because we're not asking the question we are expressions of the question we, we don't reply to questions the que we are uh, yeah, a consequence of, of a deeper question. So instead of seeing questions as a form of teaching technique or uh, a form of epistemic device, the question is ontological and we are responses or uh, reacting to a question that we are maybe only a part of, we are maybe derived from that instead of seeing us as posing the questions. It's a very human way. It's a very, it's a very, it's a very human way of, of, of thinking about questions as if they're part of a dialogue only where we pose them instead of understanding it uh, ontologically. A lot of a lot of ramblings going on here. I'll just try to move to the to the last bit, and then we can hear if, if there's any meaning in this at all, or if people have other thoughts. So, university has rift. Um, try to bring it together and try to. And as you can hear, it's very tentative. Everything and 
but if 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 it should aim towards a proper theory what would that theory contain um i think the the aspect of delay it's just uh, sticking with me the university as a delay or as a form of self-exiling a way of not connecting to power in an epistemic way which we could call certainty or truth or political power social power cultural power but there's a form of of, of hesitation of uh, delaying that conclusion which can become powerful or become an instrument of power or, or an act uh, of power i think it's a form of universities um, s try to fulfill that purpose of every every time you know researchers would sort of go on they wouldn't just stop and finalize uh, uh, their results and you know implement them in the world but they would often leap the conclusions and seek towards uh, new forms of, of knowledge so that's that form of, of exiling of of never ending uh, i think it's, it's very important as part of the ontology uh, of university you know maybe in a in a in a, in a more far-reaching uh, sense uh, theoretically um Darkness, I still can't really get away from that term. It sort of sticks as well. I'm not entirely sure what to do with it. Maybe, again, also revisiting maybe the notion of obscurity um, or here mystery is also a helpful. Um, I'm thinking to sort of Ron's use of mystery in his book, Being a University, uh, as an argument for the mystery is, is central to the university. If you remove mystery, you know, the university will just this, it wouldn't be a university anymore. The mystery is, is essential. Uh, and I'm not talking about ivory tower, mystery speculations, but becoming engaged, impassioned, uh, moving to a state of wonder, becoming, you know, uh, uh, seeing the world in, in a different way and become, uh, maybe Harman would call it, yeah, obsessed with the world, but in a, a way of whether it can be aesthetically or ethically uh, meaningful. Also, Gabriel Marcel, one of the mentors of Levinas, Totality and Infinity are dedicated to, to two of his mentors, Jean Val and Gabriel Marcel. And Gabriel Marcel also has this uh, concept of mystery. He wrote this two volume work, The Mystery of Being. Uh, and uh, the notion of, I think the notion of, 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 of mystery, but also as an ontological term, not as, as a mere transcendence or entirely transcendent, but as, as part of of being is, uh, is, is, is needed uh, in a way in that theor theorization, the implications, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about that, I'm just talking about theorization here. So um, vulnerability, uh, I think there's a giving away that self-exiling is also connected to a form of being vulnerable. And this is, these are living as terms, wounds, trauma, nakedness, or denuding which are all Levinasian uh, terminology. Because if you are self-exiling or you insist of the mystery, you're, you're also vulnerable. You're vulnerable to all kinds of, of other uh, projects, discourses, forms of power. Uh, so it, it, the university is, is vulnerable uh, in, its, in its being, I think, uh, and in its becoming, it has to be. Uh, which is is an exposedness that is uh, that is that can be difficult to uh, to, um, to to tackle or deal with. Living as is also talking about this spending of oneself, spending of one's energies, uh, taking removing the bread from one's mouth and giving to the other. He has these very corporal uh, images in in otherwise and being a, or beyond essence. That sort of spending of itself, uh, almost making itself superfluous. Uh, I think that's essential uh, to the university uh, to really to be a university uh, with the purpose of making itself uh, uh, superfluous, really. So try to spend away of something that's also at the same time energizing you, the university. Uh, and the last, uh, I'm not sure about this insomnia bit, but I think it's it's interesting. It uh, also re it reminds me of uh, yeah of the forms of attention Sharon Ryder was giving a keynote at the second path conference in Middlesex where her keynote was about this attention the awareness 
which is not really instrumental. It's not necessarily intentional. It is a, a certain form of attention or awareness, which is central uh, in our academic uh, practices. And of course, it reminds also of, of Heidegger again in the conversations on a country path, this differentiation between uh, waiting and awaiting, which I, I think I mentioned a few times. When we are awaiting something, there's always an intentionality. We await our, you know, it's our turn to go to the dentist, uh, unfortunately, or, uh, you know, moving forward in the queue to in the ice cream. Uh, stall or what we are awaiting for something to happen uh, for example me finishing this uh, 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 presentation but in a state of waiting we're just waiting you know we're not waiting for anything in particular there's no intentionality uh, so this sense of, of vigilance or insomnia is also at, at least for me a uh, helpful uh, forms of guidance in in thinking about uh, may, maybe also our academic practices, which can be ex extremely difficult to instrumentalize, of course, and operationalize. But there's something uh, there's something in in that notion of, of of insomnia or waiting. I think which is maybe the the Heideggerian uh, term that would be appropriate, which is interesting. Okay, so the university has rift. Uh, yeah, I think it's an for me. It's about the invita invitation to institutionalize, I think, differently, to think about institutions in, in different ways, that they're not, again, these are just forms, you know, the campus we're in, the buildings, classrooms, uh, blackboards, whiteboards, computers, um, you know, water coolers, cantinas, chairs, you know, everything that's in it, that's just, just a mere form. Uh, and the university could take place many, many places. It goes, connects also to your work, Georgi, about place and space. It could really move outside the campus area. Uh, doesn't it could be, you know, enacted, I think maybe Sue Wright would say, it could be manif made manifest or take place uh, not with many different, in, in through many different forms. So I think for me, it's an, uh, maybe an, an attention to this, this form taking and uh, how it could be different. Uh, on how it could be uh, practiced uh, differently, and what the what the community what the community means, what what is holding the university together. I think these four aspects are actually quite central. At least they are uh, to me. So yeah, this is just where I've reached. I think I, I apologize. There's no uh, there's no nice bow bow tying here. It's uh, that's what it is. So yeah, that's where we end. Thank you. Thank you, Soren. Um, all right, um, we, we we have to be um, we have to be a bit uh, rigid with time, but nonetheless, we have um, at least uh, 10, 15 minutes for questions. So I would like to open uh, the discussion. Uh, if you have any question or comment, uh, please uh, use the um, hand uh, up button in the Zoom application. Do we have any questions? Can, can really also just be comments or something Absolutely. entirely different. Uh... Oh, okay. Let, let, let me start. Maybe, maybe meanwhile, um, meanwhile, um, other people will join the, the conversation. Thank you, Soren. Uh, I, I think what is, um, at least for me, most interesting uh, in your presentation, but but uh, in, in the whole series, series uh, as a whole also, uh, is the fact that to some extent our different takes on, on ontology, you know, reproduce this quite um, interesting philosophical debate about ontology of luck and then ontology of abundance right and we have sort of for me at least um, most of, of um, our uh, our takes our perspective on the issue of ontology university can be classified as either starting from um, ontology as luck, sort of negative ontology um, or uh, more positive ontology. Uh, and I would like to maybe uh, ask you, uh, what do you think about this uh, distinction as, as useful to sort of organize um, uh, these different takes, different perspectives, um, 
Um, and maybe someone else would, would like to join. I think this might be an uh, interesting way of anchoring our uh, you know, discussions and, and then maybe trying to uh, find some, some, some theme around those different uh, perspectives uh, terms. So this is more of a comment, but this is something that, that I had in mind uh, while listening to your, to your presentation today. Just very briefly, I think that, uh, of course, here, negativity and positivity are mixed because the uh, form of negative and, and so on right and that's what what is interesting in the in the pair of uh, the word pair or concept pair that you you mentioned Jakob that this sort of it's a a positive form of negativity um, which is interesting yes uh, I don't know about yeah the abundance and also um, yeah the spilling over the excess which is also a living Asian term that's too much uh, maybe that's too much for any pr professional practice to contain or any mm -hmm. person to contain or any strategy to contain. That's simply too much. So the universities are spilling over. It's a, yeah, and it's an, an abundance. There's just too much, uh, which is central to keep that uh, maybe place or, or mm -hmm. state of abundance too. Yeah. Thank you, Jacob. Good point. Oh. All right, uh, we already have some hands up. So, uh, Georgi, I would like to invite uh, you to, to join our conversation. Um, thank you. Thank you, Soren, very much for your inspirational uh, talk. I just have this following question. Uh, I don't know if audience knows, but the last year at our university, we had this uh, webinar about places and spaces, and Soren presented a very interesting uh, a presentation. He just had this notion of university as in between place, which was mentioned also today. So, and so my question is the following: How will you connect this notion, university as in between place, with this notion you presented today, university as a rift? Uh, for audience uh, to remind them, Soren uh, last year paid this attention to university as in between place and leaving Plato, Abyss, Kierkegaard, crossing Nietzsche and threshold Heidegger. And he connected these uh, notions nicely within this umbrella notion of university as in between place. And so can we make the connection between this concept and the concept you presented today? Thank you. Very good, uh, very good uh, point, uh, Georgi. And maybe it's difficult to see what the university is, is, is in between because it's, it's far, too far removed. That was one of my initial points that it's too far removed from societal practices. It's not really in between. Of course, it is seen from maybe from an overall point of view or macro level, but that embeddedness of the in-between state of the university is actually being in between in professional practices, in public spaces, in dialogues, you know, with in a form of citizenship or whatever that that uh, Reike has also uh, written about. So the university moving beyond that, the, the campus area, uh, I think is essential or the academic practices moving beyond is definitely essential. So, so that in-betweenness can actually become, yeah, practiced more and not being maybe hidden away, not that, the campus should be dissolved as a, a brilliant form of community building, a very important community building going on in universities on the campus side. But the university, it is, it is. I, I don't think it's in between enough, maybe, which of course also carries with it a certain risk of being, you know, dissolved or kept, captured uh, altogether. That's my only reply, Georgi, today. Thank you. Uh Okay, uh, we still have a question from Franek, and there is also a question in the chat from Andrew. Uh, so, so maybe Franek, uh, you, if you, you can pose your question, and then we will move to, to Andrew's uh, question from the chat. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much for a talk. Really, really enjoyed. I, I had a question because I saw you, most of your examples were from a teaching area, and I, I fully understand that. But I, I was wondering, have you thought about uh, applying this concept of dark conology also, for example, for uh, other activities of like academic uh, scholars, like scholarly, scholarly publishing. And I thought about it also because like when I was thinking, when I met the uh, language of darkness, like used to describe like university and, and academia, it is a discussion about like a predatory publishing in, in scholarly communication that's often like described as some kind of 
dark side of like publishing. So like in, in this like mainstream language, there seems to be like this tendency to describe like some set of like good journals that are in some kind of light. And then there is like this dark side of this like uh, fake or journals not worthy to publish, etc. And like, do you think, so, so like there are I think, like two, two questions in that. Like, do, yeah. do you thought about like some, practices of like scholarly communication that that can be like uh, understood uh, differently because of like the concept of dark ontology or and do you think it can like change somehow a language how we describe uh, scholarly communication thank you Franek. yeah very good questions and to the first question yes uh, i've tried to use the term darkness to analyze the organizational complexity of phd schools uh, uh, before and that was sort of when I was researching into doctoral supervision uh, more specifically uh, I became aware of this all of this sort of uh, nothingness in the institutions that seemed to be gluing everything together uh, because the structure couldn't really explain the coherence of a researcher community so there's a lot of, of darkness in 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 a PhD school uh, I tried to to use that as an example also in my current project, which is about societal impact or societal value of humanities uh, PhD research, that form of, uh, of, uh, of, of maybe unvalued, unrecognized, unacknowledged form of um, societal meaning making uh, or contribution, which cannot be measured, which cannot be documented, which cannot be pointed to. So there's a lot of darkness in, in the impact discussion if you want to. I don't think we've done that yet in the project. I, I think they could be used in, in that sense as well to try to fly into or come into other forms of, of value that are not immediately identifiable with the usual uh, instrumental uh, vocabularies. And also I have this interest of uh, university leadership and that uh, form of, of um, uh, I don't know, yeah, um, what's going on? What, what, is, what are leadership practices? What is the relation between leaders, uh, the leadership and external stakeholders? What dialogues are taking place? And to me, maybe that's more just a form of a mystery, uh, which we are sort of planning to move, uh, to move forward with in the future and also to explore more empirically uh, through observations and interviews, which could be very interesting too, maybe as a form of institutional uh, or uh, inter-institutional form of darkness. But that's, uh, that's some examples. Uh, your question is very good, and from the very beginning, when we started, when we published the first paper in 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 sixteen, I think, and seventeen was this this issue was from seventeen. Uh, people have reacted to that sort of darkness. Is that uh, is that a, no, it's not negative, but that's living as uh, intentional amb ambivalence or ambiguity, which is also something we try to clarify in the the first pages of, of the paper that it's not you know good or bad. It's uh, it's neutral maybe in value. It's uh, it's something that's not immediately understandable, visible, detectable, demonstrable, you know, experiential, uh, and so on. But of course, it's maybe 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 I sh maybe one should shy away from using that term, Farnik, because as you say, it 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 connects so easily with something bad, right? Something negative. The dark side. We know it from Star Wars and. And we know it from all kinds of places. The dark side is not a place you want to be often. Um, so yeah, maybe maybe the term has run its course. Um, but but it's a Levinasian term uh, or the obscurity. So it's it's not really to yeah. We used it because we found it in Levinas. Uh, but it's it, it is difficult for us to to use it because some of these questions always uh, come up. So yeah, thank you for uh, reminding. Uh, Maybe uh, challenging the term again, Farnik. Uh, okay, thank you, Soren. We 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 still have uh, several minutes. Uh, I see also a question from Rika, but we have the question from the chat from Andrew, so we will deal with Andrew and then we will move to to Rika. So Andrew wrote on chat. I wondered, Soren, if you could say a little more about your thoughts on Sard's question because it seems like the university as it is, more widely understood, it should interact with problems. Can we institutionalize something that deals with questions? This is Andrew's question from, from the chat. Uh, could you try to uh, briefly interact with that? I think it's a very good point. Uh, I don't have a, 
uh, sort of much, maybe much more to say. I think it's very right, rightly seen that uh, moving away of the, the problem solving discourse can do something, of course. It's not as if it's, it's, uh, it's evil or we should not use that. It's just limited in a way that every form of, of discourse is limited. And the a question, it could also be an inquiry, but the inquiry is not really the same, I think, not in the Sartrean sense. Uh, the question in the Sartrean sense, I think, is, uh, is definitely, of course, more existential and um, uh, discomforting in a way. Um, it's not. It's not only. It's not just something we don't know. It's something we 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 don't. We are not yet, or we. There's a maybe a hole in our existence in a way. We are maybe impaired in our existence, which is not a, a negative thing. It's just what enables us also to transform and to act uh, freely. But it is definitely something that is. Yeah, it, that would be interesting to explore further. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, okay, uh, just uh, two more questions uh, as we are running uh, a bit out of time. So Rika and then Martin, and, and I, I'm afraid that we have to be closing uh, after after this. Uh, so so R R Rika, could you could you could you please uh, state your question? Yes, uh, thank, thank you. Uh, and I don't really know if it's a question or a comment, uh, perhaps a reflection. Um, or an imagination. Uh, so first of all, just like following up on, on your most recent comments on, I think there, and Andrew's comment in the chat, I think there's something really important. There's a really important potential there for actually, even though you don't want to <laughs> engage with politics, but, but there's a really important potential for highlighting the need to move away from only problems to all to also include questions or imaginations and questions can have problems but does not need to have problems so actually mm. it's like a broader term i think there's some potential in there then i was actually you know sitting there thinking uh, reminding me of of sarah robinson and and her struggles with the term entrepreneurship mm. or reminded of the playful learning project in denmark and their struggles with the term play and I think you have some of the same trouble with the notion of, of darkness. Mm. And, and I really love the term, but I also, whenever I talk about it, run into the same trouble. So, yeah. so I was really thinking, you know, when does a, a word you fall in love with do more harm than good to you, the argument you try to make in a certain, in a certain way? And what would be other words for that might be you know, more easily understood, but carry the same meaning and complexity? Mm. Uh, and I was thinking like, you know, curiosity, unknowability, uh, the term of uh, unknown unknowns or wonder or imagination or something like that, that more easily, you know, when you give it to people, conjure some pictures that are reminiscent of, of what you would like them to conjure. I think now they see something else in a certain way and then they have to struggle to get where you are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, last comment, then I'll shut up. Sorry. Um, so, so your your nice uh, frameworks are. Uh, um, I was just thinking again. Um, I think perhaps exile and self-exiling carry some unfortunate, again, images of the ivory tower and the university. You know, disassociating from the world and 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 from society and so on and so forth. And I'm not sure that's what you mean or you, you might, uh, but that's the immediate picture. I. I gets when listening to those words. And then the delay term, I think there's some nice bridges to, to slowness, slow academia, slow thinking, slow cooking that might, you know, again, uh, create some potency in, in that term that again, people can kind of follow along immediately. Mm. And insomnia, I don't know, uh, that's interesting. I don't have anything there, uh, you know, immediately that comes to mind. So yeah, so just some, some thoughts and comments also to perhaps connect it to these kind of wider conceptual philosophical landscapes of terms running around in, in higher education philosophy that, that I think your framework might really help to ground in different ways. Mm. Thanks very much, Rege. Yeah, very good comments. I, I definitely, this discussion about vocabulary and uh, maybe also moving towards new vocabulary, the terms you, you mentioned, yeah, but the, uh, uh, they are also fixed on some a specific meaning, right? And the specificity is what uh, I think both uh, Levinas and Heidegger are very good at trying to avoid. But uh, I, yeah, I, it would be interesting to maybe also 
on the, based on this webinar series to explore that vocabulary as, as you were just inviting maybe us to do uh, and to find new words because of course some of the words stuck they're, they're stuck in, in time and some of them are definitely stuck in a certain uh, philosophical framework then you cannot just immediately remove them and apply them to whatever uh, there are some consequences with that of course uh, but this is a stepping stone it's a way of thinking it's a way of of, of generating uh, new ideas and new forms of thinking so it would be wonderful with a work you know not necessarily a workshop but a, a discussion about vocabulary maybe co-crafting that that vocabulary that that we are looking for uh, because there's also a lot of terms that we are not we're not satisfied with yeah thank you Rege. Okay, and we have a very last question from, from Martin. Uh, sorry, it's a yeah, thought-provoking talk. Um, got some more, more, yeah, more um, concepts uh, under Sartrean themes, uh, revisiting them, and uh, namely um, uh, horror, freedom, and, and, and the other. Um, and uh, you, you mentioned horror in relation to uh, um, sort of being confronted with, with knowledge or not being able to be certain about knowledge from the student's perspective. And, Related that to sort of freedom, but uh, in, in Sartre's concept of horror comes in the, the La Keys to sketch the theory of the emotions, and it's more of a sort of special type of emotion that isn't intentional. Um, so it's not so linked to freedom, but it, I'm sure it has a place in, in, in what you're building there. Um, the, 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 um, the, the, the question of the other I take from your abstract, so that was published at least, um, Otherness, which is, of course, a very Levinas treats that in a sense of the way it may not be in the focus of the, the main work you were looking at. But um, I, was, I, was, I was expecting to hear a bit more about that as an invitation, just to if there's anything I've missed. Or um, I was thinking along the lines of like the, the university is a sort of an elite space, and you know, there's those who aren't in this space because they you know they're, they're not as highbrow as, as those of us that are in this space. Um, and, and the sort of the treatment of the, the perception, public perception, promoted by you know, the political right that it's a it's just a sort of place where liberal left people hang out, and it's it's not for the ordinary person <laughs> so that, that's the sort of the perception of, of other people being othered yeah um and is that a challenge people having a sort of difference yeah very good comments martin just very briefly uh, you're the Sartre expert so I'll, I'll i'll take you know advice from you in, in relation to the horror term uh in in relation to the notion of otherness yeah i, I try to uh, to avoid that uh, because it moves into that more e ethical realm really of of especially totality and infinity and uh, um, and uh, talking about existence or being and the notion of, of being which is not really being it becomes an otherwise than being i don't know maybe there's something in I, i'm just trying to avoid totality and infinity for the moment I, it's not really helping me a lot i think oh, it, it, it takes me into that ethical realm uh, which is a nice place to be of course but uh, it's just not what 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 we were after with, with this argument so yeah yeah but uh, yeah point taken i'm thinking further thank you martin yeah okay um uh, sorry for intervening but uh we, we run out of, run out of time so i will just briefly uh, sum up uh, first of all, thank you all, uh, especially to Soren for uh, joining us today, but, but uh, thanks all of you for uh, participating. This was our very last seminar in the series, but hopefully the project is uh, not um, done yet, let's say. We are already thinking about some next steps and how we can take it uh, further. Uh, but uh, we would like to let you know that uh, soon uh, we will uh, send an email to people who participated during during the series with some propositions, mainly about next year conference and, and organizing a sort of a roundtable or a symposium around um, um, around the issue of ontology and university. So if you would like to stick with us, stick to the, to the problem, to the theme that we try to tackle from different perspectives, please keep in touch with us. And this is definitely not our last word on the, on the subject. So once again, thank you very much for participating in this seminar in the whole series. And I would like to once again thank you, thank you all, and hopefully uh, see you see you in new spaces, um, even if we, we if we tackle tackle.